Um, let me start that again. Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezeen, and welcome to day eight of Dezeen 15, a digital festival celebrating Dezeen's 15th birthday. Each day over the three-week period, we've asked creatives from around the world to come up with ideas for how to change the world over the next 15 years. And today's contributor is Beatrice Galilee. Hi, Beatrice. Hello. <laughs> Sorry for fluffing the intro there after teasing you off camera. <laughs> It's all come back to bite me uh, on the bum. <laughs> instant karma, Marcus. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Beatrice. First of all, where are you? I'm in um, the lovely city of Rosario in Argentina at the moment, um, where I'm uh, living at the moment, um, between here and New York. And I am a, an architecture and design curator. And I am the founder and director of a, an architecture platform called The World Around. Um, and I was also um, a curator at the Met before that and various other uh, institutions and projects before that too. Tell us a little bit about the world around. We've collaborated with you quite often in the past, but explain what it is to people who maybe haven't heard of it. So the world around is um, basically it's an annual summit, started off as an annual summit um, to celebrate architectures now, near and next. Um, so we highlight the best projects of the previous year, um, whether that's architects who are building, whether that's architects who are thinking, whether that's artists who are making spatial projects, research, community, photography, film, art, whatever it is, um, we basically bring all those people together and present them um, in the format of an annual summit. Um, but recently we've expanded to do more than just one, one event a year and now we're kind of uh, trying to become, we're a nonprofit organization and um, on our way to becoming a, a bit of an institution, hopefully. And what's your take on the architecture and, and design world? I mean, um, you've created created a platform that isn't a traditional platform. It, it's not. It doesn't have a space. It's not traditional publishing. How? What? What do you? What is your unique insight or unique position in terms of the way architecture and design as a culture is changing around the world? Well. I think that one thing that we noticed in the, in the formation of the world around and, and our goals to try to be a more progressive, um, independent organization um, is that many institutions uh, who would love to have uh, access to the architecture audience, love to be involved in the discussion around the bigger picture of architecture, don't necessarily have um, the expertise in-house to deliver that type of programming. So we're currently, um, we, can, we sort of work in collaboration with institutions now. So where an institution may have an auditorium that's empty um, and an audience that could be really interested in contemporary architecture, but they don't have a year round curator, we can come in and present and organize conferences or events with them um, to make the most of their infrastructure and they make the most of our lack of infrastructure um, and our flexibility and speed. So it's a sort of plug-in um, relationship there that we that we work with uh, existing institutions um, to provide them with what I think is really important, which is a bigger picture of what architecture um, is around the world, a really global take. Um, we don't just put forward celebrity um, names or important figures um, based on their buildings, but we sort of put people forward based on their ideas um, and the potential for transformational change um, that we what, we what we believe to be transformational change. So that's our plan. And you've recently written a book. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, um, during the pandemic, um, I was busy um, making bread last time we spoke. <laughs> and then we um, I was also working on a book um, and it came out in January this year called Radical Architecture of the Future. Um, published with Fiden, and that is a kind of a compendium of uh, projects that we've presented at the world around um, and projects that I believe to be um, kind of like beacons um, of where future architecture could go. Um, they're, all, they're all real projects, like existing projects, um, but they kind of speak to what the future might be. And presumably that the contents of your book and the the work that you've been sharing on the world around dovetail nicely with the manifesto you're about to tell us about. Indeed, they do. Yes. I mean, as a curator, it was a bit of a challenge to come up with a manifesto because um, I'm, you know, consider myself more of a background person, you know, putting other people sort of forward in front of me. But I think one of the things I was thinking about when I was uh, writing the manifesto is how important it is to have more curators um, and more voices and more people, more tastemakers, you know, more arbiters 
of the architectural and design culture and um, to put forward a, a more of a plurality um, of perspectives on what's good, um, what's important. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for inviting me and also happy birthday. Oh, thank you very much. And then one thing we've learned during this, this project is that nobody's used to writing a manifesto. It's proven <laughs> quite difficult for people. It sounds like a nice commission when you first get it, but actually coming crystallizing thoughts is actually incredibly difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. And especially as, um, I don't know about you, but it sort of feels like knowing what will happen in one year, um, you know, having gone through, we've just been through, it's quite hard to predict, you know, what will happen, you know, in January, even we're planning an event in January. We don't really know if we can even pull it off because we don't know what will happen with global health crisis. So, you know, it does, it feels quite challenging to imagine um, a future at the moment, but um, a good challenge, I think. Having said that, why don't you tell us what you did eventually put down on paper for your manifesto? Do you want to share your screen now and present it to us? All right, I'm going to kick off. Um, here we go. So, thank you, Marcus and Dezine, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to start um, my manifesto with this um, kind of uh, sort of a particular, particularly sort of potent image, I think, of the Ever Given, the gigantic cargo ship that ran aground um, in the Suez Canal uh, in earlier this year, March this year, it managed to block 12% um, of the entire planet's cargo for over a week. Um, and it also sort of unleashed um, a world of hilarious, you know, memes um, and conversations, I think, um, around this kind of absurdity um, of this gigantic container ship um, that had basically, uh, that was basically being trying to trying to kind of resolve itself um, by being sort of skewed sideways across uh, one of the biggest trafficking systems of, of the world. Um, but to me, it became a kind of metaphor for all of the exceptionally large, all of the extremely designed systems and sequences that we depend upon for business as usual, but we only pay attention to when things go horribly wrong. And so, you know, it's like who, you know, there was another meme, I think, that said, you know, who would win a massive global economy covering the entire planet with billions and billions of participants or a sideways vote, you know, and then this is the kind of image, you know, as well, sort of your, your kind of cognitive dissonance, or at least my personal cognitive dissonance often between myself and my objects, you know, ourselves and our buildings, ourselves and our spaces. Um, and to me, it sort of brings into relief, um, you know, this idea that after our kind of society um, depends on centuries of industrial production, we kind of accept, we sort of tacitly accept these ugly systems, these buried systems um, that, you know, in exchange for this sort of seamless um, experience of, of, of our culture, uh, where objects are manufactured, they're shipped to our doors, they're shipped to our streets, um, everything is comfortable, everything is easy. And those same um, systems are actually toxic and they're oppressive. And the people that designed those systems are the exact same systems that um, have led to our current environmental, cultural, social disarray um, that we find ourselves in. But um, I'm not going to be dwelling too much on that as we are very aware of where we all are. Um, but so for me, my manifesto is a positive one. And I'm going to talk about some of the projects um, that I believe signal the direction that architecture and design is going in, um, a place that's maybe more, more cognizant of all of these systems, more aware. Um, maybe we're talking about a more equitable future where design and architecture is a shared experience um, that collectives are responsible, not individuals, where singular architectural projects are discussed as a bigger picture. Um, and um, this, this photograph is a, um, a beautiful um, project by Atelier Masomi and Studio Chahar in Niger. And to me, this project says, architects first do no harm. You know, this, this project uses, I think about three different materials, essentially all from a radius of like less than 10 miles around the building itself. These young female architects collaborated together with local craftsmen using generations of um, skills that were, that were developed in the region to restore a mosque and also build um, a new library. And the outcome of this project is an increasing literacy um, in the community. 
the building uses compressed earth bricks, there's no glass, there's no steel, and there's no imported materials. And the reason I know that this is the future of architecture is because all of our systems are celebrating this now. This is the Pritzker Prize winner, Lacton Vassal, um, Pritzker Prize being the most sort of so far the highest um, award going in architecture. Um, and uh, now they are celebrating the work of people who are restoring buildings who say, um, in order to create social housing, we do not have to destroy housing blocks that are no longer functional. We can actually use the materials, um, we can renovate, restore, use and reuse, upgrade, adapt, you know, do no harm. And I think the other component of this sort of ability to see the bigger picture behind um, the resources and the materials is also looking at data. And so for me, the future of architecture and design will be strengthened by embracing everything um, that informs the design process, um, informs the creation of the physical object or building, not just materials. Um, and people, bringing in people from the sort of so-called sidelines of the discipline, um, like researchers, um, really will, I think, improve our understanding of where design really situates, really sort of lives and situates in our society. So research of, of, of uh, activist and author Caroline Criado Perez, she talks about the biased algorithms that produce um, data sets that are completely gendered. Um, and, they, and those data sets, you know, we know that data is fundamental to, to everything that we do. We know that data informs economic development, it informs healthcare, education, policy, and um, those numbers are, are you know, data goes on to make sort of major um, worldwide decisions. But the problem is, that that data is not neutral. Um, that data is absolutely skewed towards a male perspective because it treats men as the default and always has. Um, and women are atypical and anything that doesn't fit into a male perspective is atypical. And so that means that bias is baked into our system, discrimination is baked into the system. Um, Caroline's work, you know, she, she drew attention to the fact that it wasn't until 2011 that the US even started to use female crash test dummies um, in the development of airbags. Just the proportion of women's bodies just wasn't even considered until 10 years ago. Um, and so these types of works, these types of research um, to me says, you know, this will inform us, to inform next generation of designers, to inform our future. We have to be more aware of data. And again, in, in terms of data, um, we also have to be informed of the other systems that are involved in this. This is an, it's a, um, a work that's included in the permanent collection of MoMA called Anatomy of an AI. Um, and this is a map that charts um, the labor that goes into the automated voice of an Amazon Alexa. Um, it charts every single component from pre-recorded voices, the fabrication, the, 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 the metal that's mined, the humans that are required to train the AI with the location of the servers, you know, it tries to make visible and draw awareness to um, the elaborate physicality and the labor that lies beneath our sort of so-called, again, sort of seamless, easy cloud, you know, wireless digital lives. Um, in the same vein, um, people like Liam Young and the work of Unknown Fields, um, draw attention to the landscapes um, that uh, are like the physical landscapes that go into the production of our, um, you know, mobile telephones, for example. Um, so one ton of rare earth minerals uh, being mined um, produces 75 tons of acidic wastewater. Um, so just in terms of scale, like what are we looking at? You know, where are these places and why are we not more conscious of them? Why are we not more cognizant? Um, of the consequences of replenishing our phone, you know, duplicate, you know, buying another set of AirPods, what, what actually happens, what's going on in the background. And I think in the future, we'll be more and more aware of this. Um, again, um, just speaking about people that have won awards, um, Weiwei, we presented their work at The World Around. Um, earlier this year, they went on to win the Golden Lion at Venice for their research in um, a prototype structure that uses recycled industrial waste brine, um, which is an offshoot um, of the uh, desalinization industry in the Middle East. Um, and they use that waste brine to create um, sort of environmentally friendly cement. 
Um, so again, just being being more aware, being more cognizant um, of all of these bigger picture systems, like and being creative. You know, we're seeing architects, we're seeing designers come up with brilliant solutions, um, and we're celebrating them for it. Um, I think again, just wanted to talk a little bit more about land. To me, a fundamental part of understanding architecture is the spatial consequences of our actions. Food production. I think it's about 40% of the habitable land of our planet is, is devoted to food production, but few of us could really visualize the spatial realities um, of industrial agriculture. Um, this is a photography, an artwork um, photography series by Mishka Henna, who um, basically this is a grid of um, arid land in Texas, but you don't quite understand what it is until someone points out to you that these tiny little specks, those little sort of what seems like pepper, they're all cattle. Um, and when you when you zoom in further, you see that the cattle um, is, is connected to basically cesspools of raw animal waste that has to be treated and neutralized with polluting chemicals. And these are the feedlots. These are the feedlots that people talk about when they complain about McDonald's. Um, these are the feedlots that, uh, that basically produces sort of more than 90% of, of um, of beef in the United States. And so I think that's particularly with food, like design has really made a really big impact and people like cooking sections um, who are, I think, nominated for the Turner Prize this year, they looked at the idea of industrial salmon as something that could be a design project because they found out that um, industrial salmon, which means, you know, if you want salmon all year round, it's gonna be probably industrial, you know, industrially produced that the salmon are unable to feed, feed on their normal diets, um, which means that their, their flesh is kind of gray, naturally gray um, when it comes in the, um, in the industrial um, processes. And so in order to, um, to make it look less kind of um, artificial and to make, make it look more artificial, they basically have to give um, pellets, dyed pellets to the fish. So the farmers feed the salmon um, pellets of dye um, according to the, the market that they're selling the salmon to. So a very deep um, red, you know, might be for um, an, a sort of Eastern market, um, lighter ones for, for um, a Western market, whatever it is, um, it can be bought, it can be designed. Um, and so these are the sort of like darker stories um, behind uh, some of the some of the food that we eat. Um, and cooking sections um, came up with this idea called a climavore diet, and you can um, follow their work um, also at the World Around or online. And I noticed um, just recently that the BBC had been talking about an idea of like a a diet for climate change. How can you adjust your diet um, to reduce your impact on the environment? And so I'm seeing, you know, the ideas that come from the design world, making it into the mainstream. So I am very optimistic about that. Another project that we included um, at the World Around highlighted issues of food sovereignty, in particular in the United States between rice harvesting and oil pipelines that are planned to go through indigenous lands. So when tribal nations um, signed treaties with the United States, it was often with the understanding that people would have the right through law to gather their traditional food in these spaces. And now the rights are being threatened because the potential of those spaces are being contaminated with oil pipelines. Um, these pipelines not only you know, radically scar the earth, but they also leak inevitably and irreversibly, irreversibly contaminate the land and the food production and the traditional food farming um, of these communities. So how can we ensure that designers and architects have more awareness on these issues, um, have more um, information um, really about the things that, like the consequences of uh, plastics and oil and movement of goods and services um, and start to think about that as part of our responsibility. Um, the other reason I'm sure design is gonna be okay in the future um, is because for years, for centuries, I would say, the dominant culture in architecture has been white and male um, pretty much um, for the whole of the time that I've been working in the industry. And I'm highlighting this Black in Design conference, which was started at Harvard University, I think back in 2012. Um, it's so fundamental that design and architecture's mainstream practice includes and amplifies voices that have been historically marginalized in the discipline. 
we will be so much better for it. Um, we need to include um, voices from Latin America, voices from the global south, from indigenous people, queer voices, disabled voices. We need more curators, more conferences, more writers, more blogs, more designs, more world arounds. Um, whatever it is, um, we need more of it, more plurality, more experiences and more visibility. And that will generate all of these things that will, it will um, that we need, we need, you know, like we said before, Marcus, you know, we need to have more arbiters um, and that will improve the culture and it will improve um, the lives um, of designers and the people that they're designing for too. So for me, the future of design and architecture um, needs to pay attention to reclaiming agency from systems that can't be photographed and can't be seen. We need to draw attention to systems um, that need to be dismantled. We need to dismantle systems that have upheld white supremacy and have suppressed and, and violated colonized voices. Um, for me, the radical architecture of the future may consist of architects who refuse to build at all. Um, in the world around, we we try to put invisible lives first. Um, we try to feature um, projects and cities and ideas um, that, um, that, that show the forces that, that shape our lives. Um, and so I'm excited to um, welcome you all to the world around when it comes up next. And um, thank you very much for um, giving us this platform, Marcus. So thank you. Thanks very much, Beatrice. You, you mentioned colonialism a few times there. That's actually been a really strong theme of several of the talks during the 15 Cave Bureau were talking about, well, in fact, their, their manifesto was for a project which would help to dismantle the colonial infrastructure in, in, their, in, in Kenya, in Nairobi, by allowing Maasai tribes people once more to, to, to herd their cattle through the city, which of course wasn't a, much of a city before colonial times. And Yasmin Lari on Friday gave a really impassioned speech and she's a Pakistani architect who's working with um, poor people and the disenfranchised and disaster victims. And she was saying that the whole architectural system is in a way colonial, not that it's really training white people to go out there and dominate other cultures explicitly, but that the mindset is I'm the master I'll tell you all what to do. Here's my building. Deal with it. I mean, do you sympathise with those positions? Yeah, definitely. And um, I think it's it's sort of evident um, when you look around at, at well, certainly the cities that um, I mean, I'm here in Rosario, and the there is no you know, the culture here. It, the, the architecture is colonial architecture because this the country was colonised, um, and so. You know, in in the US, you see it. Um, it's sort of like our values, the values of the systems um, that created the cities, are made real through architecture. Um, and when you look at cities that are all about uh, capitalism and making money, you look at the city of London. It's just skyscrapers, whatever. You know, that's the values. It's all about um, finance, and that's and that's how they manifest. And I think that. Um, Decolonizing architecture is, um, you know, it's a sort of, it, it's just an immense, <laughs> immense complicated topic and many people can speak to it much better than I can. Um, but to me, I think there's also an idea about indigenizing architecture. How can we just amplify voices and follow the voices of people like Cave Bureau um, who, um, who are working in, in these regions and doing the work themselves and just making sure, I definitely feel like as a curator, my job is to follow and amplify um, and I think it's particularly with these issues um, in the US um, more and more that we're, we're trying to come to terms with uh, living in a world that has been specifically designed for oppression, especially um, when you look at the history um, of racism and urbanized racism um, in the United States. It's, it's, it's something that is absolutely embedded in, in the history of the country. Also, in your written manifesto, you talk about how, well, to paraphrase you a bit, architects and designers for the last hundred years or more have been building the very civilization that has proven so destructive, both to other um, ethnic groups and the environment and the climate and all of those kind of things. Like, so how how complicit is the other design professions in the mess we're in? And then, secondly, what can we do about that? 
Yes, and I think that you um, identified that. You know, the an- people talk about the Anthropocene, you know, that or the Capitalocene. Essentially, that's architecture. You know, it, the the impact that humans have made on the Earth is architecture. You know, it's the it's the extraction of minerals, the extraction of of, of land, and the fabrication of cities. Like all of all of our impacts um, over the world, essentially, could 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 arguably be considered um, architecture. Of course, it's very megalomaniac of me to say that because I'm an architecture curator. <laughs> but of course, there are other things too. But the um, the the role that architects play um, is is absolutely not as uh, you know execute you know they're not, not just executing plans they can be protagonists and I think that to answer your second part of your question the architects that I find interesting and I sort of follow their work and find them exciting are ones that um, are not just executing um, you know plans and 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 they're they're the ones who are the protagonists re- reconfiguring um, campaigning you know kind of being activists almost, um, and trying to argue for a different way of being, a different way of doing things. Um, so architects who maybe take on a brief and then send it back to the client with a different proposal or find their own client um, or collaborate directly with um, systems of power and politics um, to change, like Caroline Criado Perez, like change the bigger picture. Um, it doesn't make any sense just to change a building. Um, you need to change the whole structures and systems around them. It's, it's a coincidence that this the Zine 15 festival coincides with the COP26 climate conference. So, and one of the things that's on the agenda at COP26 for the first time are the emissions from the built environment, which as we all know now represent 40% of emissions. It's, it's kind of astonishing that it wasn't actually talked about at a climate conference until this year. But yeah. how, how seriously do you think the architecture profession is taking that? I mean, of course, architects rely on clients and clients ultimately have the final say on whether a building is climate neutral or not. But do you think they're step, stepping up enough? I think that there's definitely parts of COP26, you know, the People Summit. Um, I know that cooking sections are up there. I know, you know, met various people were kind of up there campaigning for, for architecture and designed to have a voice. Um, I wasn't particularly impressed by COP's own, um, you know, effort at doing an exhibition about architecture. Um, they made this sort of bizarre website um, you know, that supposedly put forward like 17 amazing projects, but I think it needs to be so much better. It needs to be so much more substantial and so much more informed um, if they're going to really make a case, if COP26 is going to make a case for for actual change, um, you know, it needs to be, um, really needs to rally the entire discipline and not just sort of celebrity architects. Um, You know, there has to be something between you know, Norman Foster and, you know, the kind of people summit, like, like architecture has to find a role and a voice. Um, I'm not sure it's Kevin McLeod. That was the person that they put in the center of their um, exhibition. Um, I think it's got to be, uh, surely there's, surely there's something else. Um, well, the two architects, <laughs> two architects that I'm aware of that have spoken at the actual COP itself, rather than at fringe events and Norman Foster, and Bjarke Ingels, and no matter how brilliant they might be as architects, they're kind of part of the capitalist system in a way that has got us into this mess in the in the first place, you could argue. Yeah, I just think it's, you know, architecture is not, um, it's not just about building, and um, there needs to be voices there that represent the whole spectrum um, of, of architectural practice around the world and, and is not just Western um, and actually kind of reflects the whole world. You know, although the problems are largely caused by the global North, the impact is felt in the global South. Um, and I was just wasn't seeing really any acknowledgement of that or um, really any solutions or anything particularly inspiring or interesting to me um that would that would demonstrate that, that that was something that they acknowledged um and architecture is yeah it's it's a very large field and encompasses many many different positions um and many many different um you know it's not it's, there isn't one voice for architecture and i think that um that's also a problem within the industry i think 
It's, you've been in your manifesto and in your presentation, you talk about architecture and design as if they're one culture, but um, I would suggest that maybe a lot of the examples of people that are exploring alternatives, maybe are coming from the design community rather than the architecture community to try and turn this into a more positive um, a conversation to give us some hope. Uh, what signs are there, do you think, that, that the, the younger generation have kind of got this and can, can actually scale up to make some kind of difference? It's, it's all very well to do a little project that makes a point about something, but you need that to become part of the, the bigger culture, don't you, for it to, to um, force change? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I um, I think that you published this as well, but um, that there are there are practices like um, you know practice architecture who kind of came up with this idea of hempcrete, but they they didn't just come up with the idea of hempcrete. They also made a farm to to grow the hemp, you know, and so they they have kind of plans to create zero carbon on a more of a scale that includes the sort of the life cycle of the product. And I think, you know, you're right, of course, design is a different scale than architecture. Um, I know there are um, probably later on in your um, in your manifesto series, other people that will be presenting these other types of visions for what architecture can contribute. Um, I do think that, I, you know, the Weiwei project was great um, where they were trying to rethink about what concrete could be. Of course, it needs to be scaled up. Um, but there are definitely, I mean, I, I teach at the moment and um, I've been so, I'm so glad to have that relationship with the next generation of architecture students because their values are very different um, than the values that I was taught as an architecture student. Um, you know, they are um, climate change natives, basically, you know, they're not just digital natives, they are growing up into a world where climate change is the biggest problem and, and everything should be going towards solving that. Um, I was, I grew up with like, which type of marble, you know, would be the most beautiful, you know, it was always about sort of aesthetics and beauty and light and space. And I do feel that there is this change where it's like, no, we've got to, let's just take a step back and then maybe take another step back and then maybe they take five, te five more steps back and start to think about all of the, the whole thing as a connected infrastructure. Um, and I think that, you know, just having access to more information is, is really key, um, as I was saying about that. So the students that you're, you're teaching, um, are, they, are they going to follow through and then build their careers around making a difference? Or, I mean, I don't want to be cynical about young people because it's, it's kind of easy to be optimistic and idealistic when you're young and then go and get a job at a, a, big, a big practice. But I, I, do they... Do they have the means to turn this into a movement or to to reinvent architecture on their terms? Well, I think that's a good point because I think that essentially it's sort of up to maybe our generation or the generation um, you know around us that needs to provide the work for for those students to go into. And I think that um, there are many new. I do see kind of you know, initiatives um, and infrastructures and institutions that are dedicated um, to this. And I think that many studios are pivoting um, to create space for this type of work and research. So I think it's up to us to provide the work, to provide the, you know, the market for it and, and for them to kind of uh, to come in and, and deliver, I think. Um, but definitely there's a, a real refreshing um, uh, interest in innovation and, and salt and like, coming up with solutions i mean architecture education gets a lot of stick you know there's the the, the long hours culture has been criticized the kind of colonialism of the curriculum the the sort of notion that the some schools are churning out cookie cutter modernists who will just go and pour concrete all over the world but in, in your experience is the education system flexible enough to respond to the the needs of of young people who who want to be taught to build a different world? Often, no. Um, and I think that what's interesting too is that you see that people are like, doesn't really seem like a great plan to spend, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds or dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on architectural education and then, you know, be in debt and be forced to take on a job to pay back my debt. Um, and so you do see now more interesting, innovative, 
educational systems coming up, being designed. Um, so you see alternatives to going to university, um, alternatives to, to being part of that kind of capitalist education, you know, complex. And so there are, I think, more and more people questioning and uh, maybe even redesigning the education process. Um, our friend Nelly, um, you know, came up with the University of the Underground. There are other universities, other postgraduate um, courses um, that are trying to think, you know, is, is architectural education very good? Not really. Um, could it be better? 100%. And so I think it's sort of how and who um, can take the reins on that. Um, but definitely, yeah, it's definitely a, um, a place uh, that could be, um, you know, that really could seed big change if we're, if we're able to, um, to rethink that. And again, back to your written manifesto, which was called The Design We Can't See. And the, the headline we pulled out of it was the most exciting design comes from those on the sidelines and, and you gave some examples of that but that those were examples of architects and designers proposing things what about uh, and this is a point you make in your manifesto people who are completely outside the circle the sphere the bubble of architecture and design stuff that isn't really considered design at all in in common conversation is that design how do we bring that into the circle or is that actually something that's actually more interesting than design and design itself is the problem the yeah I know it. I know I often think about that and I often worry it's like that tendency for architects to be like this is architecture that's architecture you know and, and same with design of course you can argue with whatever but um I genuinely do think that um you know having a having a pluralistic approach um, being, you know, accepting that um, other people may know more about design than designers. They may not strictly have been trained in design, but the information that they have, their perspectives, um, whether it's looking at data, whether it's, you know, um, people who are um, working in policy and planning, you know, there are quite, um, whether it's working with people like Holly Jean Buck, who um, you've also presented and was at the World Around, um, people who are thinking about climate change, on a sort of geoplanetary scale, um, you know, we try to bring those people into the world around because they offer, um, it's not about relief, but it's, it's definitely about sort of perspective. And I think often the architecture and design world can be a bit myopic and um, having uh, people looking into the architecture world and saying it's really important um, that designers and architects have a better understanding of the entire planet because they're the people that have the creativity, they can put together the science, you know, they can come up with ideas if we train, you know, these are the type of minds that we need. Um, so I do think that um, that having having sort of, I mean, we we presented Feral Atlas, which is a, which is a group of anthropologists, um, and their work as anthropologists is sort of drawing together all of the different systems um, and forces that change the planet, which involves architecture, which involves design, but they're looking at it from an anthropologist perspective. Um, and so it doesn't mean calling anthropologists designers or architects, um, but it does say, you know, as an architect um, should be informed about this. And I think certainly one of the reasons I studied architecture in the first place was because I found it so energizing that it, architecture was a product of so many forces that there was, you know, you couldn't understand architecture just by proportions. You have to understand architecture by looking at materials and, you know, society and history and, um, you know, capitalist forces, social forces, um, you know, it's really, it's really contains all of these dimensions. And so all of those different disciplines have to be represented when you're thinking about architecture or talking about architecture, I think. Anyway. You mentioned about that design architecture can be a bit myopic. And, and when I interviewed Holly Jean Buck, who was the, I mean, she's basically a, a social scientist, right? Who's, who's dedicated a large part of her life to exploring the impact on, um, on communities of the infrastructure that we might need to solve climate change. And if you think about like an, an oil pipeline that crosses a continent, you don't look at that and think, ooh, architecture. Ooh, design but somebody did that design that and it might well have been someone who went to design school but ended up getting a job in the oil industry rather than a, a, in some cool product 
studio. So, so what is the difference between those two, between a, you know, like a train, which we consider a design object and an oil pipeline? Why is one considered part of a culture and, and the other not? Right. And I think that kind of, it sort of hits on a point which, um, which I find really interesting, which is this, this sense of just like neutrality that architecture and design may have towards things that are not part of our world. Um, it's just, oh, it's just a train. It's just, you, you know, those landscapes, those maps, they're all political. You know, there's nothing neutral about them. They're all, they all have agency kind of, they're all um, part of this, um, they're all part of a bigger picture of, of powers and infrastructures that we have to pay attention to. And so when we were talking to um, Elizabeth Hoover about food sovereignty issues and pipelines going through indigenous lands, she was saying that, you know, the people look at maps as if they're neutral. Maps are not neutral. Um, you know, they just, whoever created the map has the power to decide what people look at when they see that map. And if they, they, if, they if there's indigenous lands and they're not, labeled with anything they're just left empty it looks like it's totally fine to put a oil pipeline through there and so i do think that um this sense of of like not not really even seeing the design component can be um really dangerous um and very privileged and and then very um yeah kind of something that that um we need to take responsibility for and the fact that there is all of this um stuff called the sidelines or stuff that isn't designed the fact that that we categorize that those of us in this privileged bubble of design categorizes is that is that is that our fault that we haven't we don't consider that to be as important as the stuff that we do consider design um i think it's a culture change and i think that we need to improve and I think that um, these conversations are important. And I do think that um, the, you know, it's not necessarily about blame, but we, the, of course, one shouldn't really use the word we <laughs> ever um, because it, it doesn't really make sense to use that term. And I think everybody has completely different experiences. And I think that the, the issues around design and architecture and representation are, are, are real because of that, you know, and, and there is a sense of like, we're all the same. It's like we're not all the same. We have extremely different experiences. We're treated very differently in the world. And we have, that's why, again, I think we have to create more space for different types of platforms um, that put forward other types of experiences with design. And um, yeah, I think that that's the issue that I, I find, that I find myself kind of wanting to hear more, more diverse stories and more um, less about objects and more about and more about things that I sort of care about or that I think you know that sort of deeply matter. And finally, we know we set we set all of our contributors the task of thinking of something that could change the world in in fifteen years. And as I said, it's a complete coincidence <laughs> that this is taking place at the same as COP twenty six, where for the first time the work of architects is on the table as, uh, as, as part of the problem in terms of carbon emissions. And it's very hard to figure out what's going on at COP because every bit of good news is then followed by a bit of bad news about, you know, fiddling the figures or, you know, like countries <laughs> not going to deliver on their promises. But 15 years from now, if you look back on this time, I think we will all agree that it was a pivotal time no question that this is a, a really crucial time and the decisions that are made now will affect us going forward. How do you think this period will look when we're looking back from the future? Are you optimistic that, that there's enough of this bubbling up of, of young talent and outsiders that, that they can make a difference? I, I am an optimistic person, so I'm going to say yes. Um, but I think... What I hope in a way is that we look back and we're just it's kind of ashamed <laughs> and we've, we've kind of managed to sort of power through this moment where COP26 was kind of a, a sort of washout and we've got to the point where it's just really impactful and change has happened. Um, and I think we'll look back and just be like, how did it take us so long, you know, to, to, to work together and um, to collaborate on these things? Um, that's my positive and also slightly 
depressing answer. <laughs> no, it's a good it's a good note to end on. I think that regardless of the outcome of COP, I think even if COP the outcome of COP is disappointing, that gives everyone even more of a challenge, doesn't it, to kind of to to address that in the work that we do going forwards. Exactly. Yes. Beatrice, thank you so much. It's been great thank to you. speak to you and hope to see you at some point in, in reality. Absolutely. I hope to see, hope to see you soon too. Thanks for inviting see me. You soon.